Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining everyone uh, this evening. My name is Cal Rivens, and I'm, uh, I have the privilege of serving as department head in the Department of Computer Science here at Virginia Tech. And uh, I've been uh, given this really slick College of Engineering mask, but also since I'm in my home office, otherwise known as my son's uh, former bedroom, I'm going to go ahead and take it off now uh, since I'm by myself. And we will continue that way. So again, thanks for joining. Um, uh, obviously, we'd rather do this in person, but I think most of us are getting kind of used to this mode. And uh, hopefully, I'll be able to convey some of the exciting opportunities in the Department of Computer Science uh, for uh, students here at Virginia Tech. Uh, my goal really is to just give some general uh, comments about computer science as a field. Uh, and then a little bit about the department, the Department of Computer Science here at Virginia Tech, and then a few things about what it might feel like to major in computer science, to actually take a degree uh, in CS from Virginia Tech. And so my assumption is most of you obviously know a ton about computing. It affects all of our lives. It enables a lot of things we do in our life. But you may or may not know a lot about the academic um, uh, discipline, so to speak, of computer science. So that's kind of what I'm going to focus on. Um, and if you're an expert at this, uh, if you've already you know, taken several CS courses, most of this you know, but it, I think hopefully it will be helpful to kind of give some background as to how we approach computer science here. And again, what it would, what it would feel like you know, to be a CS major at Virginia Tech. So uh, let, me, let me start with it. You know, if we did word association and I said, what's computer science? A lot of people, the things that might pop into your head are things about programming, right? That, that computer science must have something to do with coding. It must be programming. And, you know, what I would say is kind of, but not really. Um, so the way I like to explain it is that, um, you know, computer science is to programming kind of like architecture is to construction documents or, or, or architecture design documents, right? Um, so, so those are really important to architects. Architects have to know how to read construction documents, how to produce construction documents how to describe and discuss and, and, and think about design using construction specifications and architecture drawings. But it's not the study of drawings. It's not the study of documents. And neither is computer science the study of computer programming. Uh, obviously, there's a, there's a fair amount of programming in computer science. It's an important skill, not only a very employable skill, but one that helps you understand the concepts and the issues uh, and what's possible and what's not possible and what's easy and what's hard uh, in a software enabled system. And so as a computer science major, you'll do a fair amount of programming, uh, probably on the order of half of our courses, depending on which electives you take, uh, involve quite a bit of programming, but a lot of them don't. Uh, and, and similarly, when you think about career paths, um, some of them involve a lot of software development and programming. Some of them don't. Uh, we have many alumni who, uh, especially 5, 10, 15 years out of school, they don't write a line of code. They do lots of other things involving software and computing systems, but they're not, you know, programmers. So that's the first thing to sort of dispel if that's kind of the assumption that studying computer science must be just learning how to do a bunch of programming. That's not the case. So what is it? Um, well, I like to talk about a couple of things when I talk about what computer science is. Um, first of all, I talk about software and software-enabled systems. That's for, that's for sure. That's mostly what we think about is, is, is systems that are enabled or empowered or, you know, animated by software, which nowadays, of course, is many, many, many things. Uh, but I also like to talk about those two verbs there, study and design. Um, and those are important because, um, and I underlined them there, to remind us that in computer science, we come to the problem or the opportunity or the, the, the activity as scientists, but also as engineers, right? Study is, is, is kind of a science word. How does this work? Try to understand it. What's even possible, right? How do we describe this phenomenon or this entity or this system? Design is kind of an engineering wor word. How do we make a better one? How do we design and build and implement and maintain something that is safe and is efficient by some measure and that is usable and that is, you know, respects important things like privacy and security and on and on and on. 
So one of the things that I like most about computer science, and I've been in the field kind of a long time. Uh, I came to Virginia Tech in 1987 already, and I've been here ever since. Um, but it's one of the things that I like and many of my colleagues really like about CS is that we get to wear both of those hats, kind of the scientist and the engineer, and we bring it to the thing, you know, to the work that we do. Uh, we study the thing that we design, which is kind of unique in, in engineering. So what's it for? Well, you know, people talk about problem solving, people talking about managed information. This is the kind of thing that people have been doing for a long time. It's gotten a lot fancier now and a lot broader, especially over the last few decades, as we think about the impact of, of uh, you know, software enabled systems in everything, right? Just about everything. Uh, and that's one of the really exciting things about our field today. And I, and I hope to, you know, give you an image of that as, as we talk here in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so let me say a few more things, sort of philosophical things. I'm an old guy, so I'm allowed to do this kind of thing. Um, there's been a really fascinating and, and inspiring trend in our field over 50, 60 years. You know, computer science isn't that old. It really goes back to just after World War II. So we're talking late 40s, early 50s. Um, initially, uh, the first 20 or 30 years, and this was how I was trained back in the 80s, um, what we mostly thought about as computer scientists is how are we going to take things in the world and kind of represent them in the computer and manipulate them, right? So a payroll system, a trucking system, an airplane, you know, an army, uh, anything that we could represent using mathematics, using symbolic representations in the computer, and then manipulate that in ways that were interesting. That's mostly what we thought about doing. And so, you know, famous examples, you've seen movies about these things. Um, that have sort of driven the field for for many, many, many decades. Uh, but what's happened now in the last, you know, 20 years is we've moved from these sort of basic things, as important and as powerful as they are, right? This, this makes a lot of the world work uh, and has driven lots of big, famous companies and small, you know, very entrepreneurial companies to do these sorts of things. Uh, now we spend a lot of time thinking about how, I, I was going to say computers, but instead I said software-enabled systems. There are computers under the hood, after all. Uh, now we're, it's much more thinking about how those computers, how those software-enabled systems impact the world, right? So we kind of do both now. We think about taking the world and representing it in a computer, but we're also thinking about impacting the world in this sort of ubiquitous um, you know, all present uh, computing power that we find in sensors, in the internet of things, you've probably heard that buzzword, and so on and so forth. So now as we look around and we think about transportation systems and education systems and health systems and, you know, uh, extensions to human beings, right? Eyeballs and ears and uh, arms and legs. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of computing going on. There's a lot of processing going on. And so in addition to those verbs that I listed on the previous slide, things like calculate and organize and systematize, uh, now we spend a lot of time thinking about how computing allows us to do most of the things we do, right? How we relate, how we communicate, how we learn, how we, how we um, assist each other, how we gather ourselves in communities and so on and so forth. You know this? You live your life this way, but it has been transformative to the study of computer science. Because in our research and our teaching now, as we, as we prepare students, we're helping them you know, learn the fundamentals, learn the skills, learn the principles that will allow them to create and, and, and solve problems in an incredibly wide sphere of influence, is how I like to describe it. So that's philosophy. Now, let me take a minute and just talk about you know, what, what, what really happens, right? What, what if I'm going to study computer science at Virginia Tech? What if I'm going to study computer science at any, any school that has a, has a good computer science program? Um, well, this, this diagram, it's a cartoon, but it gives you some uh, understanding of how we think about computer science. And it also allows me to, to do a little quick sidebar on the differences and emphases between computer science in computer engineering, right, at tech, and like many schools, there you can get a bachelor's degree in computer engineering. You can also get a bachelor's degree in computer science. Some overlap for sure, 
some similarities, but some differences in emphases and in sort of flavor and, and, and electives in particular, but also uh, some differences in, in what, are, what are emphasized even in the core courses. This cartoon is meant to describe computer science. One of the ways we think about it is we train computer science students to be very comfortable and understand the issues up and down this sort of vertical stack that you see here, um, where on the top we have users broadly defined. This is human beings, but it might also be buildings and airplanes and cars and trains and roads and, you know, you name it. Uh, at the bottom, we have hardware. We have processors and, you know, the gadgets that run the software that we develop. And then in the middle, we have other layers. We think about, you know, so-called computing system software. That's the lowest level of software that kind of hides uh, most of the details of the hardware and exposes abstractions and, and, and ways that we can build stuff on top of those low-level uh, uh, sort of operating systems, network systems kind of software layers. And then the huge sort of broad uh, uh, layer of application software, right? The things that people write, web browsers, email clients, video players distributed systems to help you reserve your flight on the airline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a massively complex thing, but a lot of what we try to teach students is how to navigate that, how to sort of organize it, how to contribute various at various levels of this, you know, complex stack, so to speak. Um, and, and, and especially how to understand those interfaces. So it's not just about writing software. Nowadays, a lot of people can write application software. We have wonderful tools that somebody built, typically a computer scientist, so that lots of other people can, can write their own you know, apps, right? Uh, or can build their own websites. Fantastic, millions of people, billions by now around the world have developed some kind of software. Uh, the computer scientist is in the business of understanding those interfaces, how to design computing uh, uh, system software so that it's easier to build application software on top of it how to write application software so you don't make human beings crazy or, or sick or you know, uh, uh, lose confidence in, in their world, right? These are big, hard, important questions nowadays. Uh, how do you write system software that communicates efficiently and, and, and sort of cleanly with the hardware? Right? These are all important questions. The cloud on the, on the left there, the clouds on the left are just names of some typical courses that you might take uh, if you majored in computer science. And they're, it's meant to suggest that they sit at these various points uh, in, the, in this, these layers of abstraction. Now, back to computer engineering just for a second. So a computer engineering degree, which is offered at Virginia Tech by the ECE department, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, right? Computer science is offered by CS. CPE is offered by the ECE department. Um, the, the CPE, the computer engineering degree, tends to focus more on those bottom layers, especially the, the very lowest one and the one above it. Not as much on the application area, not near as much on the user level. Um, so it's a fantastic degree, very employable. It's a deeper dive on kind of hardware and lower level issues. Uh, most of the courses in CPE are going to be focused on the system itself, whether it be the hardware or the low-level system software, how to make it efficient, how to make it not use too much power, how to make it safe, right? How to make it maintainable, focused on making that computing artifact work well by some definition, right? Huge, important problem. In CS, relatively speaking, you're gonna spend a less time on the details of the hardware. Our, our majors still do take a couple courses so they know what's going on under the hood, but they're not going to take as many sort of hardware or low-level courses that would prepare them to, you know, go to Intel and design a microprocessor, right? That's more of a computer engineering thing. Instead, relatively speaking, more of our courses are thinking about the higher levels of the of this stack, uh, thinking about the user, the user community, whatever the application is, and and thinking about how to build software to actually solve that problem. So in some sense, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm prejudiced because I love computer science, but I think the scope is broader because sort of, especially nowadays, anywhere where a software enabled system is interesting, you know, we, we, that's an appropriate topic in a CS course. Um, and, and so that gives some idea of, of that sort of distinction between computer science and computer engineering. Uh, students will ask, can I do both? Uh, and the answer is yes, it's a lot of courses. 
Uh, we have a small number of students who do it every year, uh, you know, probably less than 10% of our graduates. Um, we do have a CS minor. Uh, there's no computer engineering minor uh, right now at, at Virginia Tech. So you can't kind of go either way, but some people do the computer engineering major in a CS minor. That's one way to kind of, you know, if you think you want to know everything. Uh, but most of our students find that they love so much of what's going on here in the CS uh, world that they are happy to focus on that primarily. So uh, might you be a good computer scientist? Well, the fact that you're interested in engineering at Virginia Tech suggests you're one of these kind of people. You, you like getting the right answer. You're pretty good at math and science. That's a good predictor. Um, you're a little bit stubborn. Uh, you like getting the right answer and it really bothers you when, you know, you, you, you write a program or you, you do a math problem and the answer isn't what it says it is in the back of the book. <laughs> I remember those days. Um, but I also said creative, uh, and, and I want to say a little more about that, um, and I guess it's probably in the next slide, but one of the things I love about computer science is that, is that even though it, it rewards these kind of characteristics, which is true of any good engineer, right, um, I, I think we, we have some, I won't say unique emphases, but some, some opportunities in computer science that maybe aren't quite as, aren't as great in some of the other Subdisciplines, some of the other types of engineering, and let me let me say exactly what I mean. So, in computer science, the stuff we build is virtual, right? We we we're writing software, and so, you know, to be a little bit uh, sarcastic, uh, you know, the rules of physics don't apply, uh, and so when you design, you know, virtual reality, or when you design a video game, or when you design pretty much any sort of world in a, in software. Um, it, it opens, you know, <laughs> the, 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 your horizons, so to speak, in terms of creativity, right? So there's a lot more, it's, it's more common in a computer science class or in a CS kind of career that, you, that it's fine and in fact good to say, you know, here's a wacky idea, let's try this. In, in, in the in the in the in, in, that's not always true, of course, right? If you're designing a fighter jet, you don't say that. If you if you work for the CIA, you don't say that. Uh, but if you uh, you know physics, if you're in civil engineering or mechanical engineering, you're designing a bridge, you know, or a, or a motor. Physics doesn't care, right? You can say here's a wacky idea, but but physics is it rules. Uh, but in computer science, there's there's more of a tradition and, and an opportunity to just do some crazy stuff and see if you can implement it, right? There's a lot more hackathons in CS that just create stuff in 24 hours uh, than there are in mechanical engineering. And that's one of the reasons, because in software, you can go from crazy idea to, you know, version zero in, you know, two pizzas and a, and a, and a couple of Coca-Colas, uh, which is a pretty exciting uh, mode to be in. Now, so what are we doing in engineering, right? At, at, at some big schools, computer science is in the, like a college of science. Historically, we were actually before 2003. Um, at some schools, they have a, their own college of computing because those departments have gotten so big. Um, it works well for us here for sure. I mean, at CS, at, at, I mean, engineering at Virginia Tech is really good. That's why you're interested in it. Um, we work across department lines like crazy with, with, with all our colleagues in various engineering departments. We do the same kind of things people do in engineering every day, all day, this sort of stuff here, designing problems based on mathematical and scientific foundations. But I guess this is what I was talking about just a few minutes ago. I do think there are some slightly different emphases um, in, sorry, um, in computer science that, that you wouldn't see quite as strongly in some of the engineering disciplines. I already talked about the, uh, the sort of creativity. Um, I already talked about ubiquity, right? That computing is everywhere. Um, let me talk about abstraction just for a second, because that's important. Um, and, and this is maybe, this is a warning. Uh, I don't know if it's a warning, but it's a, it's a point that I think needs to be made. If you're thinking about, will I like majoring in computer science? And by the way, we don't assume that you're, you've had a lot of background. We don't assume you've had a, a CS class. It helps to have had a programming of some kind, but we don't assume that. We have a number of students that come that really haven't dabbled with computer science at all, but they're just intrigued. Um, the point about abstraction, by, by that I mean, you know, the kind of mathematical abstraction kind of stuff where symbolic representations stand for something. 
mean something. When we're writing, when we're implementing a software system using some notation, right? That notation, that programming represents a thing, represents a concept, represents a process, represents an activity. It's not the activity itself. It's not the process itself. It's described in a computer program. Just like in mathematics, we describe things using symbols and using mathematical notation. You have to be okay with that. To say it another way, um, if you got into engineering, if you're interested in engineering, because you really love the literally the hands-on part, right? I used to joke, like if, if you built your own bicycle from scratch or you, you really love, you know, taking a motor apart and putting it back together, God bless you. I, I, I am not good at that. But that's not really computer science, right? That's very, that's very uh, tactile. That's very hands-on, right? There are parts of engineering that are, that, that are like that. Now, you still have to be good at math to understand what's going on. But we are not the part of engineering where stuff blows up, or hopefully, or where, you know, if you drop something on the floor, it makes a big noise. There are parts of engineering like that, absolutely. Uh, but that's not CS. It's much more abstract. It's much more sort of in our head than in the computer system. And, you know, when, when, when the people from marketing want to, they, they always want to take pictures of things going on in your department, right? Cool activities. And we have some research lab that have, that have cool activities and artifacts and, you know, VR equipment and that sort of thing. But we don't have, I'm a little envious of some of my colleagues because they have all these things, right? These, these, these massive things that make noise and blow stuff up. And we have people sitting at computer terminals, you know, with headphones. Um, so it doesn't sell as well, but believe me, it's interesting and super fulfilling. Okay, so let's talk about jobs. Uh, I don't need to sell you on this too much. Um, uh, so the, the, the job market in computer science is consistently extremely good. I've been here 30 some years, and we have varied between sort of a good job market and a ridiculously good job market. So our students do extremely well. Uh, employers love to come to Virginia Tech, engineering in general. Uh, one of the advantages of a big school like Tech is we have these huge career fairs. We have one just for CS alone, uh, which was running about 90 companies. Now, this past year, not so many, right? We did it virtually, and we maybe had 50-ish uh, because it was such a crazy year. And going forward, I expect that to ramp back up with kind of a blended, some in person and some online, sort of a career fair vibe. Uh, but we have great re uh, relationships with tons of companies, both on the East Coast and the West Coast, and our, our students do extremely well. Um, and I want to emphasize that, that point about diverse opportunities, too. I kind of hinted at it earlier uh, when I said that, uh, you know, many of our students end up in careers that, where they're not writing code. Uh, let, let me say that a little more broadly. Um, the, 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 the variety of companies, the diversity of companies that are interested in hiring CS grads is really remarkable. Um, and, and, you know, if I asked you who hires CS grads, you would tend to think of the usual suspects, right? Google and Microsoft and, you know, Facebook and whatnot. And that's certainly true. Amazon, uh, they hire a lot of our students, but um, still it's a minority. I mean, the rest of the students are spread out over all kinds of companies. Um, others that you would probably guess, you know, defense contractors, the intelligence community. Uh, but then it's, you know, the financial sector or it's, you know, education or it's, you know, the newspapers. I mean, um, chemical companies, you name it. There's a lot of companies that are interested in, in computer science folks. And especially as more and more of these companies, you know, kind of think of themselves, at least a big part of their company as as critically depending on, on software. And that's, that's why they hire computer scientists because hopefully they understand how to design and build and analyze and purchase and replace uh, software systems. So that's enough about, about uh, the field and about uh, sort of career prospects. Uh, let me then just say a few more things about the department and then we'll kind of wrap up with some details about the major in computer science. Uh, so like I said, we started in, a, in the College of Science. It's actually called the College of Arts and Sciences at the time. Uh, and we've been around a little over 50 years. Uh, we moved into the College of Engineering in 2003. It's been a very good move for us. And, and we're, we're obviously a big part of what's going on in the College of Engineering these days. We have about 50 faculty in Blacksburg. That number is growing uh, significantly as we speak. 
Um, many of you probably know about the big investment that the Commonwealth of Virginia is making in computer science connected to the Amazon HQ2 business up in Arlington. And so that is impacting us and we're, we're growing a lot. Our enrollments are growing and our faculty is growing and uh, we're getting new buildings and it's a pretty exciting and, and busy time in our department. So we have about 50 faculty in Blacksburg. That number should be 57 or so next fall. We'll be hiring another six or eight each year for the next several years. Uh, we also have a, a program in Northern Virginia, which is slated to get a lot bigger. That's graduate only, master's degrees and PhD uh, degrees up in, uh, up in Northern Virginia. Uh, and we're accredited as all the, all the majors are in, uh, in the College of Engineering. That's an important uh, process. Um, so if you're a CS major, what is your life like? Um, it's, it's pretty similar to other engineering degrees here. Um, because of our heritage in the College of Arts and Sciences, we, we actually have a few more electives and a few less um, just hardwired courses. Um, and so you can't tell that from this diagram, but the general mix feels like any engineering degree. You're taking quite a bit of math. Uh, the, the, if you're not used to the, the numbering system, so a, a, a typical course for a semester is a three credit hours, a three hour course. That's how we do things. So for example, when it says lab sciences there in 12 hours, that means you're taking, uh, in that case, actually it's three, four credit courses. Those are four credit courses because there's three credits for the lecture and one for a lab. Uh, math is 22 hours. That's about seven courses. There's one that's, a, that's an extra couple of hours there. Computer science, you're taking about 15 courses, right? 15 courses will be 45 credit hours. So that's scattered out uh, throughout the four years. Um, the, the liberal arts piece, 30 hours, that's a little higher than some of the other engineering disciplines. And we could have changed that a little. You know, again, that's our heritage in the College of Arts and Sciences. But we very consciously kept it that way and kept the total number of hours, I think, pretty reasonable um, because CS matches or, or marries or complements so well almost anything else. So we have a lot of students who do a minor in something else. Um, probably over a third of our students, close to half of our students get a CS major plus a minor in something else scattered all over creation. You know, some obvious things like math or maybe uh, statistics or something. But then, um, you know, art, communications, um, you know, biology, business, whatever, you know, there's Almost anything kind of makes sense as a combination with computer science if you're passionate about it and you're interested in it. Um, we have a smaller number, but it's still probably at least 15% who double major, who get a major in CS and a major in something else. I told you a major in CS and a major in computer engineering is a lot of work. You know, two engineering degrees is a lot of work. But, but a major in CS and another major in something else that's quite different, you know, history or, or political science or, you know, philosophy or whatever, th those go well. And we have a, a good chunk of students who do that because they, they enjoy that flexibility. Um, here's a cartoon. I don't expect you to, to absorb all this, but I, the point I really want to make here is that it's, it's, you know, our, our uh, I, I should have the number right here, but I know that our um, four-year graduation rate is one of the highest in the college. We, we do well. Our students, um, you know, and of course, a number of them come in with quite a few AP hours. So they end up using that bonus to either take another minor or do a double major or graduate early. We have a good handful of students that graduate in three or three and a half years if they come in with a lot of AP credit. But four years is pretty reasonable. Uh, the total number of credits isn't the challenge. The, the reason sometimes people don't finish in four years is more having to do with prerequisites. There are, most engineering departments have a pretty tight prerequisite chain, right? You sort of have to take this course before you can take this one, before you can take that one. And so, um, you know, if you, if you kind of stumble at one of those and have to retake it or something, which happens, uh, then you're kind of delayed a semester. You can do that once or maybe twice. If you do it more than twice, then it's going to take you an extra semester. Um, we do offer a lot of courses, though, in the summer uh, and uh, increasingly online courses in the summer so people can sort of catch up uh, while they're wherever they are in the summer. And that's an option as well. Uh, but anyway, this diagram is just meant to suggest the kind of typical pattern of the way Virginia Tech works. You've probably heard by now is... Um, in the first year, you're a general engineer. You don't have to actually officially declare your major typically at the end of your first year. 
first semester, most people take pretty much the exact same courses. Um, if you have room in your schedule, which many people do, thanks to AP credit, for example, um, then you absolutely can take a CS course right away in your first semester. You don't have to wait. Um, but the but the generic check sheet, the generic pattern, uh, assumes you're going to take your first CS course, that thing called Intro to Software Design, in your second semester, in the spring of your freshman year. Uh, but a lot of people have AP credit for that, so um, um, you know they they can move ahead. They can either take the second CS course earlier, or you know delay their start. However, they want to spend that little dividend, right? Um, let me pause and, and ask a, answer a good question that was asked. What, what would be the relationship between English and CS? So th I guess I can answer that in two ways. It, if the question is what's the what's the relationship for a typical CS major, uh, they all you know the general liberal arts requirements at Virginia Tech. In other words, every student has to take some minimum number. I think it's two two English classes. Beyond that, we require our students to take a technical writing class and a communications, like a speech class, which isn't English, but it's also communications, right? Uh, and so, and, and we think that's important, right? Employers consistently tell us that, yeah, they like the technical stuff, but they also want people who aren't afraid to read and write and speak uh, because it's, uh, you know, highly correlated to success in, in most careers. Uh, beyond that, we do have students who combine them in a more heavy way, right? They do an English minor or they do an English major. And that tends to be a couple of things. One is, Computational journalism is a thing nowadays, right? And so many things are data-driven, but journalism is very data-driven nowadays. So if you understand something about how data is organized and what can be discovered through data mining and so on, and combine that with like a writing journalism degree, that's a pretty interesting combination. The Washington Post comes to our career fair and hires our students. Um, the other place where English and, and CS overlap is in uh, computational linguistics, right? Machine learning. I mean, I mean, natural language processing, right? So this is computer science. This is AI applied to the problem of translating language. And so linguistics experts tend to sit in English departments. People who do the natural language processing, the machine learning in that space tend to sit in CS departments. And there's a pretty big intersection to those two. There's a question about average GPA. I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's similar to what it is in the College of Engineering. and uh, it's pretty competitive. Um, GPA isn't the only thing that gets you in, but I've seen some pretty high numbers. But it's a function of what school and, and all kinds of other things, too. So I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Okay, uh, let me see. The last thing I want to say about this particular page, then, is that the stuff in red doesn't show up very well, where it says elective. Those are, those are CS electives. In other words, those are, we have, you know, probably close to 30 now. It's at least 24, 25 uh, junior and senior level courses that are just on various topics. And the degree requirements are pretty flexible uh, in that you, you, can, you can sample. You can, you can say, I want to take a graphics course and an HCI course and an AI course and a security course or something, right? And at first glance, that might look like kind of a hodgepodge. But we really do want students to explore and to, and to get some you know, sort of advanced study, junior or senior level, in, in two or three different topic areas. Um, it's hard to know what you're gonna work on 20 or 30 years from now, right? And it's hard to know what you're excited about unless you kind of drill down a little deeper in a couple of these topics. So uh, it, we, we find that students, you know, they like to explore a little bit. And then if they wanna go deeper, they can do some undergraduate research, they can think about a master's degree, but our, our degree, you know, plan is, is intentionally pretty flexible. Now, if a student does want to kind of get a, get a brand or a, or a degree that certifies them, so to speak, or, or communicates that they have specialized in something, you can do that in two areas right now. We may add some, but in addition to sort of the general CS degree, uh, you can major, which is like a concentration, uh, in, in, in cybersecurity. So we have a secure computing major. And we have one called data-centric computing, which is sort of like a data science, you know, data analytics, machine learning emphasis. Uh, but they're really just concentrations within the generic, within the generic uh, CS degree. All right, let me just finish a couple of things and um, you can find me easily. Uh, I'm gonna put up one more slide with some other topics and then I'll turn to answering uh, several questions. Uh, you can find me on the website 
uh, uh, pretty pretty easily. Now let me. Oh, I don't have this other slide. I'm sorry. Oh, there it is. I skipped over it. This is the one I wanted to uh, just leave up here, and we can take questions about that if people are interested. All right. So there's a question. There's a question about um, uh, if I'm thinking about an application and I want to uh, describe some experience I've already had. Um, I don't review undergrad applications, but I will say that I, you know you're you're obviously invited to to write some kind of a personal statement, and so you can usually figure out ways to refer to it in there. And then, to the extent that you can submit, uh, uh, you know, sort of a resume, you, you can summarize things there as well. I don't know if that makes a big difference. It obviously doesn't hurt, and and you know they're good things to to do. But I don't know how much of a difference it honestly makes uh, in admissions, to be honest. Um, so there's a good question about uh, our classes taught, you know, what percentage are taught by adjuncts versus full-time professors? We've done pretty well there. Uh, so for us, typically, in a, in a, for, for majors, right, for courses taken by CS majors, uh, in a typical semester, I, I was just looking at this for the coming fall, we offer probably, it's around 50 sections, right, five zero. Uh, I say 50 sections because, for example, for some of our sections, there'll be, there'll be some of our courses, there might be two sections, right? If it's a required course at the sophomore level, there's probably four sections because there's, you know, 400 students taking it. But we have at least 50 sections. It might be more like 55 right now. I, th I expect in the fall, we're going to have adjuncts teaching three or four sections. And one of those is an adjunct who will teach two sections of the same class. But it's it's pretty small. It tends to be, you know, definitely less than 10 percent. We also in the summer um, give our Ph.D. students, our graduate students, a chance to teach courses. So pretty often the courses in the summer are taught by senior Ph.D. students during the regular semester. Not so much. I mean, we use we use T.A. teaching assistants a lot to help with like labs and help sessions and office hours and grading. But it's extremely rare uh, that we have a student uh, teach, you know, actually teach a course. Now, we'll use adjuncts and students a little more in what we call service courses, right? We teach some big courses like intro to programming for, you know, the masses kind of thing for non-CS majors. And we do use a few more adjuncts uh, and, and graduate students in those particular uh, uh, courses. Um, let's see. So there's a question about the relationship between CS and the creative technologies program. So what I know about that, which is a fair amount, we have several faculty involved in the, in the creative uh, technologies program. And I suppose that includes the, the new community, right? The innovation, uh, creative creativity district and so on. Um, I know there's a number of CS students who participate in programs affiliated with the creative technologies program. Um, I'm trying to think the only formal relationship we would have is we, there's a there's a minor in computer in, in HCI human computer interaction a minor in HCI we administer that minor and and maybe half the courses are in CS but the other half are all over campus that minor I don't know if it's required but it's a super common minor for people involved in the creative technologies program to take so there is some overlap uh, between ourselves and, and the folks in creative technologies, for sure. Question about AP classes. Does it improve your chances of getting in? I think so. Again, I don't run admissions, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not a voice of authority there, but my sense is it does. I, I'm pretty sure everything I've heard, admissions likes students who take a rigorous set of classes. And so all things being equal, a student who's taken a good set of AP courses, uh, it has an advantage. Now, you know, you take the AP test, right? Um, the question comes up, should I take the credit? Now, now CS and Virginia Tech, we're, we're pretty generous about that. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to get a five or something. It depends on the course. A three or a four usually gets you the credit. Um, I generally encourage people to go ahead and take the credit. Um, you know, you can, you can, if, uh, let me talk about CS in particular. So if you take the AP CS test and you do pretty well, you get it. I think you have to get at least a three. Certainly, if you get a four or a five, I would def, I would take the credit. Um, our CS two class, so to speak, the one you would then get placed into if you took the credit for CS one, essentially. Uh, our CS two class, it's pretty 
it's designed to to welcome people from a lot of places. Okay, it doesn't assume you took RCS one because we have people with AP credit. We have people from community colleges. We have people who took you know a course some at some other university. And so the the gateway to that course tries and I think does pretty well to be uh, pretty welcoming and 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 kind of even the playing field in the first month, so to speak. Um, and so generally people. You know, they 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 don't regret their decision if they go ahead and take the AP credit as opposed to, you know, just ignoring it and taking the class uh, and moving ahead with CS2. Yeah. Question about undergrad research. Thanks for asking. Um, so I, I can give you some numbers there. So last year we graduated about 300 students, right? 310, 312, I forget, bachelor's degrees. Of that number, I'm going to guess from looking at the most recent thing, close to 50. You know, uh, out of that 300 did some kind of undergrad research. We have a thing called independent study, which is a different flavor, but it's the same idea. It's informal working with one professor on some project um, at some point in their in their career. Usually that's in your senior year, but not always. We have sophomores and juniors who get involved in, in cool projects. Um, it, it's it's a great opportunity. It's one of the things you can do at a, at a big school like Virginia Tech to get to know people. A little better to get to just dabble and see if you like that and and if maybe more some graduate school might be you know of interest um, it's a great way to get a good letter of reference uh, for a job uh, application or for graduate school because you get to know a professor a little better right i mean i, I always I always tell people um, you know big schools like I went to a small school as, a, as an undergrad years ago, and there's trade offs right at Virginia Tech. You get a world class education. You get, you know, professors who are at the at the bleeding edge of the field. You get access to amazing, you know, career resources. Uh, and I'm just talking about the CS stuff now, not to mention the rest of the stuff on campus. You get the opportunity to do undergrad research with uh, on really cool projects in amazing labs with, with cool equipment. Blah blah blah. Um, I think the biggest challenge is it's big, and and so you you know you. If you want to get lost, it's possible, right? And so you have to take some some responsibility to find your to find your squad and to find your niche and to get to know some people, right? Because uh, yeah, undergrad research is a great way to do that. Student organizations is a great way to do that. Um, you know, out of the dorm, you know, you'll make some good friends. There's lots of ways to do it, but you have to take some initiative and 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 make sure you connect a little bit. I think we do a pretty good job of helping make that possible. But obviously, when we're talking about, um, you know, 300 and soon to be 400 majors in a cohort, in a class, that's a lot of people. Uh, and you'll be in some pretty big classes. So at our, in, in our department right now, uh, like a typical sophomore level class, there might be 150 or 200 in that, in that class. Um, now, you'll have labs that are smaller, with like 30 or 40 students, but the lecture it could be 200 people. That's pretty big, right? Uh, junior level class, 125. Uh, senior level class, depends on which one it is. Uh, a popular one, there might be 90. Uh, uh, we have a so-called capstone class. Like most engineering disciplines, we have like a senior design project class. Those tend to be a lot smaller because you're working on projects with groups. So they tend to be like 30, something like that. But, you know, you, you know when you're in a bunch of classes with 100 people, it's harder to connect with the professor. Right? You got to show a little initiative. You got to go to an office hour. You got to, you know, ask a good question once in a while. You, you might want to do some independent study or undergraduate research in your senior year. There's lots of ways to do it. But that's my little sort of fatherly advice. Uh, and, and I can see if you're sitting here watching this with your mom or dad, they're like giving you an elbow. But uh, it's the deal. <laughs> There's a question about how, what if I don't get into computer science, right? So let's, let's think about this. Um, here, here's how it, it, it works. So you get it, you get admitted to tech, you get admitted to engineering. Life is good. Um, first year, you're taking mostly general engineering courses. You can take some CS courses just because, just because you're interested, but only one or two, to be honest. End of your first year is the typical first entry point into a major. And there are, there are, what's the right word? There, 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 there are, uh, there is like an enrollment management target for each department, right? And departments do get full. However, if you get a 3.0, right, if you get a B average in your freshman year, then you can take any major you want. And so our major tends to get pretty full. Most years, 
you pretty much need that 3.0 because we tend to go over our target, but with students that have 3.0s. So if you don't quite get the 3.0, then even if your first choice is CS, you might, you might not get in. You might have to at least wait a semester or you might not get in all, in a, a, a full disclosure, right? Um, so you, you need to focus in that first year. I mean, if you got into tech and you got into engineering, you're capable, you, you know, that, that's a vote that you're a good student, but you have to give it the time and the energy uh, in that first year. Um, there are people who take a little bit longer way around. Uh, they might, you know, declare something else and then try to get into CS later, but that's a tricky, tough path. And pretty much you still need those grades. Uh, let's put it this way. If you don't get the 3.0, you know, I, I don't know. Past performance <laughs> indicates that you, you might not, might not get into CS at all. That's, that's just the honest answer. Um, how reliant is CS on math? Quite reliant. Uh, uh, it, it, first of all, you got to take quite a few courses, like about seven courses in mathematics. Uh, but you know, why, right? Is that just arbitrary? No, not at all. I mean, the, you know, the abstraction part I talked about, the, the ability to kind of formally argue or, or analyze a problem in mathematical terms, that maps very directly to thinking about computing and, and, and programming and analyzing how a system works, analyzing its performance, analyzing its correctness, all that stuff has a lot of mathematical foundations. Uh, and it's more than you want to know, but it's 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 a broad type of math, right? It's not just the traditional sort of calculus, although our students do take a couple semesters of calculus, and that's important. But it's also what we call discrete math. So this is things like, um, uh, you know, statistics and, and prob probability and combinatorics and graph theory, if you've ever heard of these terms. Uh, a lot of computer science stuff, especially nowadays, uh, in terms of AI and machine learning and so on. Uh, relies on that kind of mathematics, and it is it is an important piece. Now, you're not as an advanced computer scientist. Most advanced computer scientists they're not proving theorems like a like a PhD in mathematics would. A few do, uh, but they're still using mathematics in a pretty sophisticated way. All right, another question about courses related to video game development. So I'll tell you two things about video game development. Uh, the first is, yeah, there's the computer science degree is 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 a good is a path is a good path to video game development. Um, those guys, those folks are are really good programmers because obviously in implementing video games performance, it needs to run fast, and so they do uh, not only software development courses, but they do take you know maybe a few more of these kind of lower level systems and and computer organization, computer architecture courses. Because they really need to understand, you know, how data flows between memory and the processor, and they really need to understand things like caching, if you know what that is, uh, you know, memory systems. Um, and so that's that's important. And then just the software development stuff, the Java and the C and the C plus plus classes, C in particular. And then we have some advanced courses like a capstone that that where you actually, you know, build some some video games. We have graphics courses. It's nice to know some about that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a that's a career path. We have students that do that. Um, I've been told I don't have it from firsthand, but I've been told that that's a brutally competitive field. There's a lot of people who want to get into into video game programming, uh, and so of all the uh, uh, career tracks that I know our students go to, I've been told that that's the one that's maybe a little tougher to land a job. You have to be good, uh, and and you know get an internship and maybe build some stuff on your own. So that's that's the path. It's not impossible, but I've been told that it's very competitive uh, to get into video game programming. That's for sure. And then gender diversity. Thank you for asking that. I, I should have talked some more about that. So the good news, bad news, right? So good news is we're making good progress. Bad news is we were so bad 20 years ago that we have a long way to go. So right now at the undergraduate level, we have about 20%, 19 or 20% women uh, in, the, in the undergraduate class, you know, which is not great. It, it needs to be higher. It's slowly moving up. We were in the, in the single digits, if not low single digits, about 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, and so that's been a, definitely an area of emphasis. I mean, diversity in general across all kinds of underrepresented groups and marginalized groups for sure. Uh, but, you know, I'm optimistic about that. The progress has been good. Um, it used to be the case that if you were a woman in computer science as a CS major, 
you knew the other 10, you know? <laughs> and now at least we have hundreds and you don't know every female, which is, that's sort of a weird way to say that's our goal, but we've gotten to that point and we're glad about that. So we're gonna we'll keep emphasizing that for sure. Uh, there certainly are classes for AI and ML. That, the, 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 uh, the question was, are there no classes for AI and machine learning? The, the cartoon I put up was just an example of some classes. So we offer, um, I guess there's senior level, there's an AI course, there's, a, there's two different machine learning courses, one that's more mathematical and statistical and one that's more applied. And then we're offering a, na a natural language processing course for the first time this coming year. So there's, depends on how you count, there's three or four courses at the senior level in, uh, in machine learning and AI. If you want to go deeper in that, a master's degree is a really nice option. Because to, to, to do a lot of ML, at least from a computer science point of view, there's some prerequisites. You need to know some statistics. You need to know some mathematics. You need to know some, some data structures and some algorithm you know, kind of thing as well. But we absolutely do have those courses. And that's an area we're growing in uh, for sure. Uh, a couple more questions, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, yeah, what are some things about the CS department at VT which are unique to this particular college? Huh, growth right now. We're one of the fastest growing and one of the larger departments on campus, that's for sure. Uh, you know, I think that that the, I've been I've been having, talking about this topic for a long time, and especially the last couple of months because we're in faculty recruiting season. And the thing I talk about, um, probably one of the things I talk about the most is Virginia Tech's CS department, like Virginia Tech as a whole, takes very seriously this this service thing, right? So you'd probably know that Virginia Tech has this motto, ut prosum, right, that I may serve. It sounds a little corny, but it's a real thing. Uh, the university and our department is characterized by, by students and faculty who like to build things and design things that actually make a difference in somebody's life, right? In some community, in some, uh, you know, voting system, right? In some health system. That, that, that really is a big deal around here. And from the Board of Visitors and the alumni base and the president right on down, into the department. And the faculty that come here tend to have that kind of a mindset. And you might think, well, computer science, of course you're building things that people want, right? Well, you'd be surprised. There are some CS departments that tend to be a little more theoretical, a little more insular, you know, because the topic is fascinating and you can, you can close the office door and do some really cool math and, and build stuff and not be quite as connected to your users, you know, to the community that you're impacting. So I, I think, I, I, I'm not claiming we're unique in that, but it is an emphasis that I think characterizes the way, the way we do business here. Um, and there's a question about, you know, career opportunities and placement, uh, what percentage of students have jobs and that sort of thing. Typical survey, I haven't seen the one for 20, but the one for 2019, um, it was like, it was around 90, 92%. And this is a, uh, four months out, four to six months out from graduation. So it's super high. I mean, about 10% going to grad school and, and over 80% already had a job um, within a month or two of graduation. Uh, if, like I said, for if you're a reasonably good student, uh, uh, you know, you'll have great opportunities. I'll also tell you that uh, uh, about 80% over, a little over 80% have at least one internship. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, and that's that's pretty important in our field is to take advantage of those uh, paid internships that you can get uh, through through our career fair. Uh, last question, uh, um, and this is kind of a relative question: is what 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 comparative advantages does Virginia Tech have over other universities? You know, I think the things I point to is kind of what I what I kind of hinted at before: uh, uh, big, well-funded, lots of momentum you know, research-oriented school. Has a lot of advantages. The one thing you have to be, ask yourself is, you know, can I survive in a place where there's 1,200 CS majors or 1,500 CS majors? I, I certainly think you can. I've seen students, thousands of students, really thrive and find their niche and take advantage of the opportunities. Um, but that's probably the one thing that would feel different if you went to a smaller school, right, that, that maybe graduated 30 students or 50 students. You go to a big school, you have tons of opportunities. Every semester we offer, you know, like I said, probably even at the senior level alone, probably 15 or 20 different courses. The problem isn't what to take. The problem is what to take, right? There's, there's too many good choices. 
Uh, and so those are advantages that we would have. To compare us to other big schools, it's going to be very similar. There it comes down to the place and what feels right to you, right? We're very similar to UVA in a lot of ways. Some slight cultural differences, but that's a good program too. Uh, we're very similar to NC State. We're very similar to Penn State. You know, similar. I went to Purdue, super similar school uh, to the you know the kind of opportunities and the kind of feeling that the place would have. All right, I think we need to pause. There's other things going on. I hope this whole uh, uh, open house is useful to you all. And uh, feel free to drop me an email note if you have some follow-up question. I'd be glad to try to answer it as well. But for now, I will wish you all a really, really good evening. Thank you for joining. Take care.